that the Deli Alley piece is as unfortunate as it is, it's a great piece for us within player care to show that someone who is at the very top of the game can have similar, not the same, but similar issues as a under 14s player, whatever age group, whatever phase. And I think it's refreshing to see people like that speak out. People just have this perception of what, what you're complaining about. You've had a, you know, you've had everything done for you in the academy and you've had a great experience. I, I'd have I'd have loved to have had that. And I, I was part of that problem. When I first started, I was like that. You kind of come across as that kind of nagging dad figure of going, oh, do you know how many lads are killed to be in your position? His words were, I'm loving football at the moment and it's probably taken a good number of years to fall back in love with football because I think a lot of the time from 8 all the way through to 18 if they stay within our academy or another academy it just gets more taxing it gets more you know, game time, match time more preparation, more sports science So Lee Wood, welcome to the podcast. My first question is, how did you become involved within the area of player care? Tell us your story. Yeah, well, thanks, Christy, for having me. Um, Well, by chance, if I'm being honest, um, I kind of did a undergrad degree, uh, sports science and and coaching, wanted to really get into kind of cutting-edge sports science. Clearly, that that didn't work. Um, yeah, I thought I was going to be headhunted by Lucas Aid Sport or some kind of really innovative company. Um, fell into the gym industry, and it's when I started to doing kind of personal training stuff. I really had a, a feel for for people and helping others and kind of going above and beyond. Then um, I really kind of wanted to get into education background of doing a teaching assistant, and then. Wanted to train as a teacher, did that for, for two years part-time while working full-time and an opportunity came up at uh, Bolton Wanderers to be part of their uh, BTEC tutors for the international programme that they did. That then kind of uh, spilled over into the actual academy. I needed to, I, I was asked to fill in for some of their tutors uh, for the academy scholars and then was offered head of education. Uh, for any of those who are listening, who kind of know that role. It's kind of a multitude, multifaceted, and a lot of it is personal development, transition, aftercare. And yeah, I've always had a passion for personal development, both from my own perspective and ho- and, and wanting to support those who um, wanting to kind of be the best that they can be. And then when you, you, you're in the academy system, you you quickly realise there's you know a massive job to do to support the, the you know hundreds of players who are going through that academy at any given time, uh, you know through the seasons. And yeah, it's it's kind of gone from there. And an opportunity came up at, at Wigan while I was there when some funding came in from the Premier League to really do something that I've always been passionate about. So I'm very fortunate in the position that I'm in at the moment that. You know, an opportunity came our way. I've been preparing in the background for it and stars aligned and here I am. Where do you think that passion for personal development comes from? I don't, I don't really know. I think it's, I think it came it was really that far back to the personal training piece really of kind of people coming in and, you know, asking, oh, you know, I've got a wedding coming up, or I've got a holiday coming up, or you'd have um, some amateur athletes who'd be going, oh, I'm competing in, you know, this fun run or this half marathon and kind of really intrigued me with my sports science background and really wanting to help others, not for, you know, for love, for money, for, you know, fame or glory or anything like that. And it's really from then, I think it's just grown and grown and grown. Every job role that I've had, that seems to be, you know, really something that's anchored in or embedded within those roles and has really kind of flourished within me. So it's just something that has naturally come on. And I think that's really important when you're, you're involved in play care, that it is natural and authentic. And, you know, people listen to this who are within, you know, any professional sport, not just football, you know, you don't really get, especially the, the support staff stuff, you don't kind of, do those role for the for the money and the finances. So it's it's got to be a passion because that's that's what gets you through your tough days, your tough weeks, and your tough months. 
So for those that are listening and watching that might be intrigued around playing care and the new nature of it, how would you describe mm. it if you were to maybe give an overview of what player care is within football? It's different. <clears throat> I mean, in football, there's core principles that you've got to, um, you know, you'll see common within the within the job roles and the job specifications. There's some out at, at the moment, which is a good thing because we're inviting new people into to that role and bringing new ideas. But I think the biggest piece is the aftercare. That's almost the end bit. The, you know, the start bit is how you induct them, how you provide them with opportunities to develop, how you provide them with unique experiences. Um, and ultimately, from the day they come into the building, they're on a transition ju- journey with you, you know, all the way and in, including that that aftercare piece as well. So I think they're the, they're the core elements, but it's hard because it's different from club to club. You know, I mean, I, I get on well with quite a lot of player care um, people at other football clubs, other academies, and we all just do it so different. There will be core elements that will go through it. You know, that'll be the the, the lifeblood and the the philosophy, if you want to call it that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 so unique. You could go into three different clubs that are very geographically quite local to each other, and they'd all do it in a pretty much diff- a very different way. Um, but there'd be some things that you'd pick out of it, and I think you know. From the, from the induction piece, the you know the the development piece, and the the, the transition all the way through to the aftercare, those, those are the key elements. And whatever you can shoehorn in, or whichever direction you want to go through with different age groups and phases, that's what makes it unique per academy and per football club. Describe aftercare then. So I'm I'm just intrigued on on um, how you ensure that you protect players and individuals within that process. Obviously, players might get released, players players might get injured. Players might transition to other countries or other leagues. I'm, I'm intrigued on how that works for you because I can imagine that there's a, a range of different facets there that you have to support. Yeah, there is, and, and you're dealing with individuals, so you know you can have a you can have a philosophy, a protocol, a procedure, um, but it it quickly goes out the window because you, you're dealing with individuals, and, and like you just said, you know some individuals will be quickly kind of transition out of your academy because you know they've been injured or um you know they're they're going up into the first team you know they're graduating from your academy and and going through the professional ranks with your club with another football club you know there's five or six main pathways and that's what really keeps you passionate as well because you know that there's not just one way to do it it's not just like oh follow that pathway of that player and you know you will be successful. The aftercare piece is is so difficult because you've got those individuals with individual needs who come from different backgrounds who you know may have been recruited locally from far, so they may be returning back home to a different country or a different end of of, of the country in England, and it's it's so difficult because you can't physically there's the, you know there's. For us, there's three of us in our player care team, but even that, you know, the numbers are far outweighed. We'll be, you know, releasing players, not on a large scale, but you know, season by season, that database will keep to, will keep increasing. You, you look at uh, Southampton, how they do it. You know, it's 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 one person's job to be able to do that and update that database and to check in on a regular basis. It's hard, but I go back to the the, the natural and authentic bit. We try and form those relationships, real relationships with with our players, so that when and it's not if, it's when they do leave us, you know, we'll we'll keep in contact like family do, where it may not be on a regular weekly basis. Friday night, eight o'clock, we pick up the phone and, and and chat to each other. It's ad hoc, it's natural, you know, when they're away, busy doing what they're doing, and you know, we can be busy as well. It's about you know it, it being natural, and when we do pick up the phone to one another, drop each other a message, or you know, interact via social media, you you know, naturally, you'll then will input that data into your database. But uh, it's about keeping it natural and authentic as much as you possibly can. It's it's difficult. It's probably the hardest part of the role, really, because they are part of your family, and they will grow wings and they'll fly off and and, and go to you know. We've got lads from our year group last year. One's going to Australia. One's in Dubai, one's in America. Um, there's one who's playing non-league football locally. So they're, they're all over the place, really. And it's so difficult. You're on different time zones, different forms of communication. But you know through the the kind of family feel and the, the, the relationships you build up, you'll, you'll keep in contact. 
I'm intrigued on, on that process around good practice then, because you mentioned earlier that a range of different football clubs, which might be local, have different strategies and different approaches. And you emphasise then in, in your comments around keeping in touch with players and making sure that they're supported in your duty of care after football and, and kind of looking yeah. in it from a humanistic perspective. It's a bit of both, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you. Um, I'm very fortunate, you know, the club that I work at, their, their philosophy in you know our document that we have that basically governs and you know kind of aligns us in in what we do is about developing the person as well as the player um you know that's not just on a piece of paper or a powerpoint slide it's something that we do live and breathe and we all have to remember at the end of the day and, and sometimes you know we do forget we, you know we work for a football club we're here to develop players so that you can get into the first team who can be successful um, but that anchors us back to, you know, what we're, we're actually doing, you know, Monday to Friday or Monday through to Sunday. You kind of sometimes don't really have a day off on, on some weeks. But, um, yeah, and, and then I suppose really it's – we you can go into any club and they can have fancy branding, they can have slogans all over the place, a neon sign, a, you know, a buzzword, a, a phrase, whatever. It's about living it and, and bringing it to life. And I'd, I'd like to think that that we do that. You know, that's not for me to say. That's not for us as a as a club to say. I suppose the best people to ask for that are the, are the players and parents that that we serve. But you know, I'm quite confident that they will say that. You know, we do bring to life what we say we're going to do. You can have all the best plans in the world, but unless you're going to follow it through and, and bring it to life, it it means relatively little. And clubs, most clubs are, are very good at it. And most clubs, like different ways, you know, some clubs probably won't have a, a strategic plan and be able to impress you with a PowerPoint or, a, you know, a, an infographic or a timeline. But they're doing it and you walk into that building and you'd be like, oh, if I had a lad, I'd want him to come to this academy because I know he's going to be well looked after, well coached. He's going to be looked after like one of the family and I know they care about him, whether he's in the building or when he leaves the building as well. And then conversely, you'll have some clubs who, you know, will probably try and stand by certain slogans or, you know, kind of have a buzzword or a phrase. And then you can go in there and think, yeah, it's probably, you know, not the best experience, but it's it's difficult to have a recipe for it because as we're talking about individuals, what our players' needs are will be totally different to our neighbouring club. Their needs are, you know, even if they're just, you know, 10, 15 miles down the road, they're unique, their age groups, their phases, how they're coached, the the environment, the culture, it will need totally different things in, you know, a, a totally different space. How do you assess issues that transpire within the game? So, you know, public factors that have happened recently, um, Delhi Alley, you know, issues yeah. around with with Man United, with Mason Greenwood, for example. Yeah. Do you find yourself within your role critiquing that or looking at it from a, a point of view that can be challenged? Because it's so subjective. There's so many different areas for us to challenge certain things that happen. There might be so many different things that arise and you have to approach them um, with a strategy which is quite instinctive. What What's your thoughts on, on just the general feel of protection of players and, and how it's approached? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the first part of that is, you know, we, we are here to be challenged. You know, you're dealing with human beings, you're dealing with individuals and what we may do, someone will have an opinion on whether that's good, bad or anywhere in between. You know, I can also be honest and open here and, and say that, you know, not 100% of every single one of our players that will ever walk through our door will have an amazing experience. And you know, for, for whatever reason, the academy system just won't be right for them or for whatever reason, we're not the right fit for them as a, as a football club. And we know that as, you know, as, as adults, regardless of whether it's football, you know, work, university, you know, sporting team, you've got to pick what's right for you. I think the Delhi Alley piece is, as unfortunate as it is, it's a great piece for us within player care to show that someone who is at the very top of the game can have similar, not the same, but similar issues as a under 14s player, an under 21s player, you know, whatever age group, whatever phase. And I think it's refreshing to see people like that speak out because. There's still a lot of stigma. There's a lot of hard work that's been done. There's a lot of movement that's been done in the right direction within football around that mental health piece. 
but there's still that stigma of you know somebody opening up and kind of the and I can only imagine what would probably going through his head when he's thinking yeah I need to open up about this and there will be that thought process of going this could be interpreted in a way that I'm weak or I'm not up for the fight anymore or mentally I, I, I'm not strong so I can't I can't take that springboard now at this club or the next club and, and kick on my football career. And for someone like that to, to stand up and speak up about what he's going through as an individual, which he didn't have to share, he didn't have to do, um, will just mean everything to a high number of, of lads within the academy system and professional football as well. Um, you know, and Delia has just, you know, just won. There's, there's, there's um you know a current trend now of quite a lot of you know top level football players who are speaking out about it and and academy players you know I know quite a lot of work that um go again are doing in in the space in in mental health in, within academy football specifically I know they were part of the um documentary on on Amazon Prime around mental health within academy football and it's just another difficult challenge for us to face you know we we haven't got the the book, the 10 step process to follow these things and you'll be absolutely fine. It doesn't work like that, does it? Um, so it's, it's a challenge and we're here to be challenged and it's a constant improvement. It's a constant thing for us to, to question ourselves and going, ah, what are we doing? Is that filling, fulfilling the needs of our players? If there's a player that does reach out to us, whether he's with us or, you know, during that transition when he, he's left the academy of going, did we do the right thing? Could we have done more? Did we point him, put him in contact with the right support network? Could we have supported him internally? Should we have done that sooner? It's it's a brave thing, but also a scary thing to to be challenged and to question yourself. And, and you will do constantly. And that's where the improvement comes. And then that's where we can make those positive changes in mental health within football. Biggest misconception is footballers are... <laughs> Are rich or get paid for doing something that they love what's their problem what have they got to worry about how can they be feeling down why have they you know whether they've left an academy and gone on to you know really good things have been transferred to a you know a, a, a top level football club or whether they're being released and they're going to get a second opportunity to go lower down the tiers or over to america or wherever it may be People just have this perception of like, oh, what, what are you complaining about? You've had a, you know, you've had everything done for you in the academy, and you've had a great experience. I, I'd have, I'd have loved to have had that, and I, I was part of that problem when I first started. I was like that. You kind of come across as that kind of nagging dad figure of going, oh, do you know how many lads are killed to be in your position? But when you see them day in, day out, season in, season out, the sacrifices, the discipline the failure, the failure of losing the game, of not getting selected, of getting injured, and the constant judgment that we still all put them through of whether it's education, whether it's from a player care, are we going, you're not, you know, you're not making the best of this opportunity. You you're not going to be fulfilling your own potential. You know, the sports science and medicine staff will be judging them on their fitness testing the coaches will be judging them on their um, performance in training the analysts will be judging them on their performance on the match day i as a you know 44 year old man couldn't survive under that scrutiny but yet we expect young boys young men to do exactly the same and i think that's the biggest misconception for me people outside think it's, oh, it's easy what they got to mourn about and when you spend a day in a life with them or close to it you actually realise what they've got to go through and it's it's tough. Do you think that will change in terms of the culture of academy football, in terms of that ruthless nature, that pressure to succeed, that pressure to, to get better and better? I mean, I'm, I'm interested on that because, you know, there's so many cases of players making it, but I can imagine that there's more cases of those that don't make it and those that need to think of other transitions and other avenues and, you know, we only we only see the glamorous perspective of academy graduates who make a professional footballing career. But I can I can imagine that there's a there's a baggage towards that, and and whether that culture needs to to be changed or adapted to to to, to enable player care to thrive. I think it has adapted. Um, okay. From the clubs that I've I've worked with, it has it has adapted, but it's it's still there. But then. My personal opinion, I think it still needs to be there at some level because, yep. 
I'm not a coach, you know, I'm not a manager, I'm not a talent scout, you know, I don't, but I do know human beings and I think they need to be pushed because that's what the game's going to dictate. That's what the sport yeah. is going to dictate. And I think we'd be doing them a disservice of going, no, let's cha- totally change the culture. Let's make it not comfortable, but, you know, let's ma- not make it as challenging. Let's not put them under that scrutiny, but then... I would pretty much guess they wouldn't have the career if we were to do that. And I think there's a part of natural selection. And as I was going, as I go back to the point I made before, sometimes the academy system isn't for everyone. You know, sometimes, you know, a certain course at university isn't for that person. And, you know, we can't all be footballers. There's, you know, the numbers are there to prove it. You know, we we can all live and dream and eat, sleep and drink football and, 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 do the 10,000 hours and all the other kind of stuff and misconceptions that are out there. But it doesn't mean we're going to make it. And there's a reason why there's only a few make it because only a few have actually got what it takes to do that. And I think they should be rewarded for that. And let's be honest, yeah, you're talking Premier League, then financially the rewards are there. Um, but yeah, I was listening to a podcast of um, Eze at Crystal Palace and he was saying that um, about people don't actually understand the sacrifices and he was likening the sacrifices he had to to give up, not going to parties of his mates and having to watch what he eats and the sleep routine, the traveling and, and, and out. And then he, you know, he shifted it onto his parents of saying, you know, they've got to travel the length and breadth of the country to support him at a very young age just for that chance. And he said, you know, there's he, technically there's probably – has been better players or, you know, there's people within his age group where he's like, yeah, they should be with me now. He said, but there's a reason why there's only a few of us make it because there's only a few willing to make those sacrifices and, and to do what's necessary. And I think there's a balance there. I think, yeah, player care is us. We're there for that support network for when, you know, as a natural thing they do, when I say a breakdown, I don't mean emotionally or physically, but where there's points where they're going, I'm really, I need a tool for this. I need, some, you know, some support, some help. But I do feel it has to be at that elite level and that that level of challenge and scrutiny because that's the, what the sport's going to dictate. You take Harry Maguire last night, you know, against Scotland. You know, he's been scrutinised left, right, and centre. It's no good if we take that away and you know, in terms of his upbringing and his his academy journey, because at the top top level, you're going to be scrutinised. Do you think that's the key ingredient then in terms of making it through the academy system is that persistence, that dr- drive, that monotony of of travelling and staying focused and being disciplined in diet, etc. I'm intrigued on, on what you think on that because there's always this emphasis on physical, technical, tactical, but from what you've just mentioned then, it's kind of seen as the, the catalyst. Yeah, I mean... If I go back historically to, I mean, it depends what your term made it, you know, and and we talk about it a, a, a lot with, with our lads and I have done, you know, it's my 10th season now in academy football and I've done pretty much every single season. There are different forms of success and there should be no shame, no stigma, no negativity around someone going, oh, success for me is... I'm going flying to America. I'm going to do a US scholarship. I'm going to live an, an amazing life for four years and get my education paid for and travel across America when, you know, it's the off season or spring break. And that's success to that person. But then to another person, if they just have to drop from a category, category two academy to category three or league one to league two, they might see deem that as failure. So it's it's difficult to determine what is success. But I think, if you look at, and certainly if I look at the the players that I've been involved in over the last 10 seasons, those who perceive to have made it, got the professional contracts and stayed within professional football, as corny as it sounds, they are just really good human beings. And because of that, they can have relationships with key individuals. They can take criticism. They don't take it personal. They it's almost in within them from a family background, from a culture, from a social aspect, from an education. It's all that mixing part. And I think if you take any one of those things away, it's not to say, right, well, you're not going to make it if you're not, you know, if you've not got a good upbringing or a good family, because there's always outliers. But in the main, 
they are really good, decent human beings. And every single lad that I've had the pleasure to, you know, to support and and help along the way, even it's just as small as one percent, it will be. You know, I know that you could invite them to a family event. You know that you know in a crisis or an emergency, they're the people to count on. And I know that probably doesn't kind of feed into the you know um, kind of high performance or what does it take to be elite. And it sounds a little bit corny and cheesy, but that, that's the truth. You know, these people aren't mentality monsters. They're not, you know, kind of like, oh, to hell with everything else. I'm just going to be a footballer. They're people who identify as different people, have different interests, and are just really good human beings. That's the key element that I see in everyone that I've had the pleasure to be with in terms of supporting them on their journey who are still involved in football. Well, about the role of parents and Lee, so you, you kind of emphasized it um, uh, in terms of your comment, but how do you educate parents on, on the journey and, and all these different areas you mentioned, the discipline area and the kind of the, uh, the nitty gritty of making it as a pro? What, what, what kind of activities do you do there to ensure that the, the, the player is protected? Because I can imagine, especially at younger ages, that they're, they're around the parent more than the coach and, and the club and, and other staff. So I'm just intrigued on your practice there. Yeah, parents are, you know, the coaches at home, uh, it, you know, if you will. And yeah, you know, in terms of that transition, the younger age groups, you know, the foundation phase, the nines to the nines to twelves, it's, you know, they they play a massive role, you know, not to say that they don't when they get into the older age groups and the YDP, the 30s to 16s, but um, you know, they're, they're then growing as individuals, as human beings and teenagers and kind of having outside interest. Now, in terms of the parents, I think that's potentially where I see the next steps forward for player care. Now, yeah, obviously the clues in the title were here to care for, for the players, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a full support network. It's a full 360, you know, include staff in that, you know, the schools, the families, Parents are, you know, a key stakeholder in, in, in their lives and their development and their journey. And, you know, we recognised last season that we need to do more. So we've put in a parent programme for, for our parents where they'll get bespoke sessions, whereas before, you know, no kind of disrespect and it's probably bad on our part for a kind of a lazy approach of just kind of keeping them informed of what their lads were getting. But we we quickly realised as a team when we sat down at the end of season review and thinking, no, they need more than that because they're key individuals. And rather than just telling them, right, this is what your lad's getting and this is what, you know, we need you to support us in supporting your lad. It's like, but the parents are human beings as well. They have distinct issues, problems, needs, challenges, bar- <coughs> excuse me, barriers and the like, you know, the, the travel piece, the... Um, you know, the quickly grabbing something to eat on the way from school into training, vice versa. You know, it's it's that's never ending as well. And it's just a, yet another challenge. So we're trying to kind of, um, we're trialing this year a parent program where they'll get um, six bespoke uh, workshops and we'll see how that goes. And we're, we're constantly in communication with them, you know, whether that's a digital voice or in person where we want to get their feedback and opinions on what we do. Is it, and it's what I said to you before, for them to critique it, for them to push back on us and challenge what was what we're doing, and, and then you know we will also question ourselves of, is that enough? Do we need to do more? Do we need to pick better topics? Does it need to be fewer topics but more per season? And it's it's just another challenge, and I think that's going to be the next step for for a lot of clubs. You know, there's a, a number of clubs who are doing parent programs and parent sessions. But I think that's going to be the, the next key bit, especially with the the younger age groups, because it's, I, I you know, none of my, my lads are, you know, involved in academy football, but I can only imagine the, the toll and the stress that puts on, you know, I'm sat here now in my kitchen, academy parent, probably, you know, on any given night, may not even be getting in until this time or even a little bit later. And then expecting to do the whole thing in the morning of, right, get your bag ready, let's get you to school. And it might be a fixture away at Liverpool, at, you know, wherever. And that's another bit of transport. And it's it's so difficult, it's so hard. And I don't think you actually realise it until you're probably in it. And that's where we, we need that feedback from parents to help us help them because they're human beings too with different set of needs 
And ultimately, if we're doing that by default, they're going to be able to better support their their son on their journey. I like that because it's recognizing that it is a commitment for parents to ensure that their son or daughter is um, thriving within the academy football and having that opportunity. Do you think that adds pressures to players then, seeing that commitment and seeing that, uh, you know, you mentioned kitchens and, and kind of eating on the road, etc. I'm, I'm intrigued on, on, on what you think about that because I can imagine that's added pressure as well in, compar- in addition to all the different facets you said. Yeah, I mean, in, in the main, parents are, are supportive. You know, I'm a parent. It's There's yeah, something weird happens at birth as this kind of internal invisible switch gets turned on and it, it changes your whole <laughs> life, your whole outlook, perspective on everything. Um, and in, in the main, you know, parents are superb and they only want the best for their, for their lad and they realise that, you know, we do as well. So it's, you know, it's a great partnership. But you also, you know, there's sometimes where, as we all do, you know, where some parents will step over the line. And again, that's where we're here as a support network, not as play care, but as a whole team of staff, you know, to kind of, if it does become a, a negative thing for their lad to to see that they're either putting pressure on, you know, the classic car journey home, you know, you hear constant stories of, of that, you know, from other play care officers and, and people in academy football of like, oh, you know, mum's already on it him or dad's, you know, dad's kind of on it him going, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And I did that with my lad at, at, at grassroots. So you can, it's it's a support we all love, isn't it? And we all get passionate about. And because of that, it's just sometimes we will step over the line. We're, we're emotive individuals, aren't we? And in the main, you know, parents are really good support. Even, you know, that some will make mistakes as we all do. And that's where that kind of parent program comes in because it's not to go right. This is the right way to do it, the wrong way to do it. We're not here to teach them how to be parents. They're doing an excellent job already, but it's about going, okay, so this is where this happened. How can we support you better? You know, if that's, you know, you're getting emotive because your son's not getting game time. Is that better that you can have a sit down conversation with a coach and they can actually add context to it? Look, I brought him off because you know, he wasn't having much success against their fullback. Therefore, I didn't want him to get negative on himself and thinking he's not the player that we think he is. So I just took him out of that arena and that's why I've done that. I've not done it to punish him to not get game time. And, you know, the art of conversation, I think a lot of time is lost in a digital uh, age, saying this via a video call, the irony. But um, it's, (laughs) yeah, I think a little example like that, you know, we'll all make mistakes. But in the main, parents are are superb and, and they're, there for the same reason that we are, because we want to be able to fulfil that potential for that individual. And if that may be, you know, professional football at you know whatever level, whatever division in whichever country, fantastic. If that then transpires to play non-league football and working full time and, and living a successful life and starting a family, that is also success. You know, we're we're no different to, to, to parents. We want the best for their, for their son, and 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 they do too. What are the common themes that have have become apparent during your time within academy and professional football around player care and well-being? Is there anything that stands out? Obviously, the conversations that you have are confidential, but is there anything? Yeah. Is there is there a recurring theme that you've noticed during your time within the game? Um, I think from from our perspective as a staff as player care roles. It's the lack of engagement, really. Um, And I think we, and I say we, I'm talking team of three at at, at the club I work at, not we as in every single player care person, but I think we need to do better because I think that's the big, well, I don't think, I know that's the biggest frustration for us if you're talking about the aftercare piece before, um, of there's massive strides that football's made not just within play care you know in, in every aspect in culture mental health player cares a lot uh, yeah obviously we've we still got a, you know a long way to go in in that regard but there's a massive support network there and i would probably challenge anyone listening to this and and, and yourself of giving me another business another sport another pathway career educational vocational whatever it may be 
where you get the level of experience, the level of support during and after your time within that system. Um, but there's still a massive frustration because you still hear stories and they come out every single season from different clubs, different levels, some Premier League all the way down to you know League Two uh, and now non-league with some of those setting up their academies is lads who feel that they didn't have the best experience or even worse than that where they're saying there wasn't the support there. Now, it's not for me to say that they're wrong, what their experience is their experience, but for us, when you get ghosted, to use a better phrase, by lads who you worry about that keep you awake at night because you're going, "Ah, it seems to be, you know... You know, things aren't going well. It's not looking favourable. You know, he's probably not going to get a professional contract. Or he's probably not going to get that scholarship at 16 and he's not really engaging with us and we've tried to sit down and it's hard. That Those are the ones that keep you up at night because you think, what are they doing? Have they got something sorted? Are, are we over worrying? Are they just being ultra cool? Have they got something sorted in the background? And you you want them to engage. I think some of the the... the horror stories or the headline ones that that you know you see in the paper and the news those do concern me but i also know individuals within those clubs and think you know there's been a breakdown of communication there on whatever side or both sides so the reoccurring theme for me is the the, the lack of engagement now whether we're creating that ourselves by putting on i won't say too much support but such a high level of support that they feel like oh I can go back to them at any time when it doesn't work out here or it doesn't work out in this bit or or whether that's just a natural thing that they are young men and they're finding their own way and they don't necessarily need us all the time and then they will come back when they're more mature in two, three years' time. But the engagement one is a, is a reoccurring trend. I think from a, a player perspective, the reoccurring trend for me is you, we do an exit pack with all our players in the YDP and the PDP, uh, kind of like 14s, 15s, 16s, and the 18s and 21. So we sit down with them, we go through a pack and we, you know, give them his point of contacts, here's some, you know, ideas and to have a conversation with them and to get ideas of what they're looking at and what pathway they're looking at taking so we can be informed on that, but also kind of give them a few pointers or, you know, put them in contact with people we know will be able to assist them. And, a lot of the time, or what especially came out last year, even more so in a little bit the year before, was them saying that they they, they lost the enjoyment, and it's and it's hard because when they get into scholarship, you know, it, it is a job they're getting paid. Um, I mean, you know, we're talking about the Delhi Alley piece and Paul Pogba, you know, in terms of you know you can take away the money and the fame and all the rest of it, and I think what we've seen and whether we'll see it again this season is lads saying that they've kind of fallen out of love with the game. They don't enjoy it as much. And maybe that's that scrutiny piece we've just been talking about of, you know, oh, yeah, I just, I love playing football and I kind of lost that love. I was in touch with, got one lad who I was supported while I was at Bolton uh, five years ago, I think he left. Um, and he's playing non-league now and he, his words were the other day, he's going to come in and talk to some of our 18s at, at Wigan about um, life in non-league football. That's one of the pathways that some of our 18s might go into. And his words were, oh, I'm loving football at the moment. And it's probably taken a good number of years to fall back in love with football. Because I think a lot of the time, from eight all the way through to 18, if they stay within our academy or another academy, it just gets more taxing. It gets more, you know, game time, match time, more preparation, more sports science, more play care, more education. And I can see that now of where they probably lose that love for the game a little bit. And that's really sad, really sad to be sat across somebody and going, yeah, you know, in a way, if I was being honest, I saw this decision coming and I'm not too upset because I've not been really been enjoying it for the last six or nine months. And you think, wow, that's, that's not, that's awful really. Cause as a, you know, as a, as a man, and I don't know what you were like, Christy, but you know, you, you want to play football, you want to do it 24 seven, you know, whatever weather, whatever conditions, jumpers for goalposts. And to hear someone say that it's, it's tough to take. How do you change that then Lee, in, in terms of thinking about, you know, socialization or trying to prevent burnout or trying to prevent mental fatigue towards um, football in, in, in the case of your players, is, is that approach that, coaches need to kind of look at or 
welfare needs to look at. I'm intrigued on how that that is modified to support that process because, it, like you said, it's a common theme that that is apparent. Yeah, I mean, we we address it, you know, as a as a full team of staff, um, and you know, you you. You bring up those comments and those things as your team of staff we meet on a regular basis, you know, even, you know, informally you'll have those conversations and um it's and it and it's something for, for to challenge us as an academy as well moving forward and you know, every academy in, in the country because I'm sure no we're we're not alone on that. I'm sure, you know, it's the people who are working other academies up and down the country at other football clubs listen to this, they might go, Oh yeah, yeah, we we, we see that or we're starting to see that. Um, in terms of addressing it, it's, and that's, you know, that, that exit pack, that's the first step. We want to get their views, their honest, open opinions. And that's the first start for us. That the next bit is then if is those conversations. And I think it's hard. There's no kind of remedy to, to correct it straight away. Because as we were saying before, if you make it, less scrutinized or less judgmental or less intense or less challenging. Does that take away? Are they, are we then setting them up to fail for their career because they might come back to us and go, well, I didn't make it to the top, top level because it was just middle of the road stuff. And it, it's, it's difficult really. And I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how, how other clubs go with that if they have similar trends, but ultimately we're here for them as individuals and they know that we've got, you know, a natural and authentic relationship and they can speak up at any time. For me, that's a massive key and a massive starting point and a mm. massive piece because you keep that conversation going. And as I said before, it might just be we were the wrong fit. You know, we're one out of 92, um, you know, clubs in the in the top four divisions. It could just well be our environment, our culture just wasn't for them. And yeah. there's nothing wrong in saying that, them feeling that. And it may not necessarily be that we have to change it all of it, we might have to tweak it a little bit, but it still might might not be right for them, and they may need to go and find their right fit in another club, in another academy, in another league, another division, another country. And once they find that best fit, ultimately that's all that matters. As long as that that lad gets the success that they need, that they won't fulfil their potential, you know, kind of regardless of where that is, that's that's all that matters to us. One thing I picked up on in your um, answer previously was around kind of that making sure that there's protocols in place to help exit. And you mentioned that there might be a little bit of a worry if, if there's a lack of engagement. Yeah. When do you know? Where do you know to set boundaries within that? Because obviously there has to be a little bit of, um, you know, uh, autonomy for the individual to to kind of work things out and, and take responsibility and. and yeah. grow up as a human being do you know yeah. where where do you find that boundary how, how do you deal with that because i can imagine that's been a that's a challenge from your perspective because you want the the individual to be protected and supported but also at the same time is you know when i reflect back on my life you know some of the struggles i had have made me a better person yeah. and i've learned from those lessons where, where do you where do you fit within that and how do you enable that to to occur well i think you know you've summarized it great there in terms of yeah, you know, sometimes we have to go through those challenges. We have to go through those deemed failures of getting released, not getting selected, or, you know, we're not the right fit for them and they've had a maybe not the, the best experience with us, but then that's meant that they've been able to fully enjoy the next experience with somebody else. But in, t- in terms of the aftercare and the contact and the engagement, we have a tiered approach. So in that first season after they um, leave us and, and, and get released, you know, in the immediate term, there'll be, you know, a meeting with key staff and then there'll be, um, you know, a point of contact either with myself or a member of the player care team. Um, and kind of long, medium to long term, then is, it's a tiered approach. So the set regular, and we make them aware of it when we do the exit pack saying, look, what's the best form to contact you? What's your, you know, what's your wishes? Is it email? Is it letter? Is it WhatsApp? Is it on social media? Is it a phone call? So that, you know, we try and align it with them. Um, and then we make them aware and saying, look, on this regular basis, every six weeks for the first season after you leave us, we'll be in contact. And that just might be a, 
hey, how are you doing? Might be a sharing of an opportunity that has come up. So, you know, the classic one for the the 16s that we did last year, you know, they've got the the EFL um, exit trials. You've got the Premier League player care, uh, two-day residential at, at Loughborough uh, University and unique experiences like that to make them aware of, look, just because your time has ended with us doesn't mean your time in football is over. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like I said, whether it's a a natural conversation, whether it's sharing them with a resource or uh, sharing them uh, an opportunity that's coming up, we do that every six weeks for the first season. Then we reduce that the second season, so it's every 12 weeks, and then reduce it again uh, in the third season. Um, So that we are, like you said, just giving them that space, that time to grow. Um, And hopefully, if we do our job correctly, they'll need us a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. But it doesn't stop at that three years because you have an invested interest. We're, we're dealing with human beings here. We form relationships with them. And it's, you know, you want to see them flourish. As I said before, that, you know, the lad from Bolton who, you know, and he's not just one, you know, exception. You know, there's quite a lot through the years of you strike up a really good rapport and relationship with these people. You want to follow them of success going, oh, seeing you, you know, score the other night in, you know, the first round of the FA Cup for non league, you know, whoever. Amazing. And that might be a lad that, you know, I've not spoke to him months, but you know, he, he left the club I was working at six six seasons ago. You have a an invested interest in them, you know, a, on a human level. So you know, we but that's not to say that's the right way, and we've got it right. We'll review that. We do every single season, review every aspect of our program, and and kind of pull it to pieces. We invite other people in. That's why we connect with a lot of play care people to, for them to come in and go. Oh. Why, why do you do it that way? Why, you know, why wouldn't you do it this way? And you're thinking, oh, that's a good idea. We might change it to that one. But yeah, in answer to your question, it's a tiered approach, kind of little by little, get it, let it be less infrequent because we want them to grow and ultimately fly, grow wings and, and, and be a success. But we still want to continue and follow. And yeah, our family just gets bigger and bigger every year. How do you think player care will evolve over the next few years? Obviously, it's a contemporary area that's come about uh, recently in comparison to maybe other disciplines. Where do you see it? Where do you see it playing out? Yeah, I was talking about this with a colleague yesterday. Um, My personal opinion is, I think player care will. I mean, player care has been done for as long as I can remember. It's just now under a title. It's under a job role. It's under the accountability, the ownership of either one individual or a number of individuals within that club or academy. Like I said previously, my role as head of education, that was being done. You were having to contact players, um, you know, support them in going to university and all the rest of it. I see the the development now of, of, of player care and how that's going to kind of emerge and grow where there'll be kind of subsidiary job roles and titles kind of within it that go either underneath or sit aside it where that's a transitions coach um so i'm currently doing a a course at the moment about uh, understanding athlete transition and 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 being on that for for five days and and doing some of the work that's associated with it you kind of get to see you think oh you know you can easily sit back and go oh we do we're doing all right. And, you you know, people pay your lip service and go, oh, you're doing really some good stuff. It's not until you go on a course or you go to other clubs and do a visit or you're having a conversation like we are and you start to reflect, you think, oof, we need to do more on that or we don't really do anything on that. And transition, I think, is a massive piece because, like I said at the beginning, the second they step foot in our building to the second they leave us and even beyond that, they're in a period of transition. We all go through a period of transition in in our lives, whether that's from a child to an adolescent into an adult, from university into, you know, your first job role and then the career ladder. So I see two or three probably um, job roles coming up that sit either alongside or underneath player care. Transition coach being one of them. I feel the mental health side will, will or probably should um, become another role because as you've alluded to there, that's a massive piece, not just in academy football, but the elite level and the professional level. And then I think the aftercare piece should be a designated standalone position because if we're really going to be able to have, and I'm talking probably more a little bit from a club perspective here because we, we want to, 
have that family feel. We want to have, you know, our vision, our dream is to have a bespoke program for our alumni, our academy graduates, the people who have since left us and, and gone on to bigger and better things or wherever it is in the country, whether they're a wind farm engineer playing non-league, come back from the US with a, you know, a, a degree and four years of playing football out there, whatever it may be, we want to welcome them back as a family to celebrate their successes, to we have an invested interest to find out how they've done, you know, how they're doing. And then really from a bit of a selfish perspective of getting them back in to a room, into the building to tell the next generation of players going, look, you don't, it's not all just about football and the numbers will mean not all of you will make it. But here's another individual who's been massively successful. Tell them what you're doing, how you've gone about it. And if they can see it, they can dream it, they can do it. So I see those three positions really kind of branding, uh, sorry, branching off from that. And I think you've only got to look at uh, Abby Carrington, who was at uh, Nottingham Forest and then Swansea and, and, and now gone to Manchester United in a, you know, in a well-being role. I think, you know, those top clubs will recognise that and create bespoke positions. And unfortunately, it takes those big five or six clubs to do that. The leagues to recognise there's some value in that and then it will, slowly filter down. Same as what player carers has done. Same as what head of coaching has done, head of education done. It's just the the natural process it will go. So I see some bespoke positions coming kind of underneath or kind of at the side of player care. And that will only be a good thing for individuals like myself because you can't do everything. There's not enough hours in the day, not enough days in the week. And yeah, it just ultimately means even more support and even more chance of those lads engaging with us and maintaining those relationships moving forward for the number of players that we deal with. Yeah, I was I spoke to Abby actually on this podcast about nine, ten months ago, and she mentioned the um, the title of player care and the, the the definition of what it is. And I think from 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 dissecting it down into those three areas, as, as you've mentioned, it enables us as practitioners academics to really explore what actually the dimensions are within player care and it gives a little bit more of authenticity of of what it's what it does and why it's needed yeah i totally agree i mean what what abby's done at the club she's been at you know it it is superb you know i've I've been very fortunate to kind of be in the same room as a, a number of times when she's kind of presented her plans and and brought them to life with with uh you know her delivery style and it's you know, individuals like that, leaders like that, who are really setting the trend, it's it's naturally, it's going to happen whereby, you know, those key aspects that, you know, we've talked about, you know, over the last 50 or so minutes, they're really niche areas. Now, maybe it might be a case where clubs will have the freedom to go, oh, actually, you know, we're talking about issues and trends. We might be able to go as a club going, right, well, our trend is we're really having difficulty around this area we don't really need a transition coach because we have that boxed off in these areas maybe it will be that maybe the the triple p rulings will free that up a little bit and let clubs really have a bespoke approach to the needs of their players but i'd be very shocked if in the next five seven years that some of those job roles or positions the titles might be slightly different but around that transition after care and mental health because they're there, it's staring you in the face. And I'm sure whether it's Abby or anybody else within player care who, who, who you've been in contact with or had on the podcast, they'll they'll tell you key themes like, God, yeah, I could do with someone in terms of really helping me with that mental health piece or that transition piece or that after. That would be an absolute godsend. And ultimately, we're here to serve the players and I'm sure they would love to have another person at that football club that know has got an invested interest in their future as well. What would you like your legacy to be, Lee? Um, wow. Um, I suppose it goes back to that engagement piece, really. I think, I don't know if it's quite answering the question or as high as legacy, but when you get contacted out the blue by lads you've not spoke about or spoke with in, in months, you know, sometimes maybe even nearly a year because, you know, you've sent them a message, they've not really picked it up or they haven't, you know, they're busy and doing other things. And then out the blue, though, you know, I had it two weeks ago, uh, another lad who's playing non-league 
football, he's going for uh, a B-Tech tutor job role. Uh, out the blue, oh, Lee, can I put you down as a reference? And then from there, you know, we're getting talking and have a conversation over the, the, the coming days. Oh, what's made you want to go for that? Oh, well, there's this role and it'll fit in nice mm-hmm. with my football. And it's things like that. It, I won't necessarily term it legacy, but I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, the majority, if not all the players who I've had, you know, dealings with or been able to support or hopefully contribute at least 1%, you know, in, in, in how they are as a human being and whatever careers they've gone into that, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, you know, that was great that, you know, Lee gave me that little bit of support or put me in contact with that person or did this or did that because I'd like to think, you know, I've got a really good relationship with the players that, you know, I've had been very fortunate to be involved in. I think that would be my, my legacy, if that's the right term, of <laughs> those lads who, you know, if you got any of the lads on, you know, that I've dealt with in the past and, and, and them speaking highly of me, I think that's what helps you sleep at night. That's why you go above and beyond. That stokes that passion, the fire, helps you get up every single day and do what you do and all the challenges and the self-doubt and the questioning, it all kind of goes in the background because of that one moment with that one player, current or former, and you'll be like, oh, I've achieved something today. I've helped that lad get in contact with that or do that application or get his hands on some funding to be able to go to America or Australia to continue his life over there or his football career. And you just think that that's pretty amazing. There's not many jobs you get that really, you know, in terms of, yeah, it's, that's a pretty amazing part of the job. And it's, it it's the reason why we do what we do. Great sense of fulfillment then in that respect. Yes. Where can listeners find you? Uh, Lee, are you on social media? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, either on LinkedIn, um, on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as the Development Locker. Um, so I do, um, sorry to kind of steal your thunder, but yeah, I also do a podcast. It's probably not at the, the caliber of yours and some of the guests that you've had on, but again, it's all around that personal development and um, you know current trends and issues within uh, Academy Football. So you can find that on Spotify and all major uh, kind of pod- podcast platforms. But yeah, if you just search um, the Development Locker underscore UK on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, you'll find me on there. But as Lee, as Player Care uh, Manager for Wigan Athletic, you'll find me on LinkedIn. We'll put all the uh, links to your podcast and your uh, social media pages in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching this, they can go and click below and check that out. Um, Just want to say thank you for your time, Lee. I think... um, Hearing your perspective um, is is very fascinating. I love your attention to detail and and how you observe certain things things within player care very well, uh, and how you brought that to life within the conversation is uh, is very interesting. And I'm sure uh, myself as well as many listen, listeners will benefit from some of the things that you've mentioned today. So thank you for your time and good luck with. Yeah, Wigan Athletic and your future avenues. No, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's been a you know great to talk to you and yeah, keep up the good work with the podcast. Like I said, some of the guests that you've had have been very high caliber and they've certainly helped me and give me food for thought of things that we're doing at Wigan. So thank you for that.